With cannabis now legal in this country, one particular molecule in the plant is receiving a substantial amount of attention. Not THC, the part that makes you high, but CBD, which is increasingly getting the label of wonder drug. Here to tell us what's actually known about CBD is Dr. Hans Clark. He is director of pain services and medical director of the pain research unit at Toronto General Hospital and the University Health Network, and we are happy to welcome him back to TVO. Nice to see you again. Thank you, Steve. Pleasure I'm to be here. I'm going to set up our discussion here just by reading an excerpt from the Globe and Mail from earlier this year, so sit tight for a second here. CBD, which can be derived from hemp or marijuana, has been popping up over the past few years in everything from mineral water to vape pen cartridges amid intense hype and some emerging scientific evidence that it is a wonder drug able to help combat a range of ailments from joint pain, insomnia, and seizures to anxiety. There's one problem. CBD is strictly regulated just like cannabis. Only licensed producers may make it, and only registered retailers may sell the products. The legalization of marijuana on October 17th did not change anything. However, many consumers and even merchants believe it is legal because, as proponents of CBD point out, it does not cause intoxication, unlike the other well-known compound in cannabis, tetrahydrocannabinol, THC. Okay, so that's the background. Let's get into this now. What is CBD's relationship to cannabis? Okay, uh, Steve, great question. So, you know, CBD is just one of many ingredients in this cannabis plant. And uh, uh, CBD in particular has uh, a, what we call, it's a bit of an allosteric modulator. So for, you know, for the, what? Uh, for, the, for the public, <laughs> it basically antagonizes the effect of THC at your CB1 receptor. So it has an opposite effect of what THC would have. So the effect of THC is to make you kind of high and happy or chilled or whatever the reaction is. Right. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a CNS depressant, so it reduces the firing of the nervous system. One of the side effects of that is this feeling of high or, or euphoria. And we know that when CBD is also at that receptor site, that it modulates how high you get or antagonizes that effect, so to speak. Anything harmful about it that you know? Of, of CBD? Yes. Well, you know, any, anything in excess can be harmful. And so, you know, one of the things that I think really needs to be um, understood a bit better by the Canadian public is the concept of how you dose this molecule. When you look at the, you know, the scientific studies to date that have shown some of those effects in epilepsy and some very high quality uh, trials that landed in, uh, you know, the big journals like JAMA and, and Lancet and these, in these areas, CBD uh, at 20 milligrams per kilogram at times was able to reduce seizure thresholds. And so that's a very high dose. Think about an adult who is 70 kilos trying to consume that dose. We know that that dose probably is going to have some liver effects. It, it, it's not, it's, uh, we've seen uh, individuals have bump, bumps in their liver enzymes, which shows a marker of problems of the liver uh, metabolizing this drug. And so, you know, there's a, a big gap between what we think we should be using or consuming and what the public believes it does and how we safely do this. And I think those are things that we have to really iron out over the next five or 10 years. How does one ingest it? Uh, great question. So I, you know, I heard you just uh, tell the public all about the different forms that are out there. Mm -hmm. The two legal forms of ingesting CBD are still the plant product, an oil product, or capsules. Those are what our licensed producers are allowed to sell to the public. So any other form at the moment doesn't have a legal framework. Vape sticks. I understand that they are now putting it in some vape sticks. Does that cause you any concern? Oh, I mean, absolutely. So again, what are you actually consuming? What is, what is the constituent of that oil? The other issue that I think many people don't understand is this issue of decarboxylation or cleaving the molecule so that you have an active form to consume. The more active your oil is, the more you can see the effects. But the question is, what are those effects that you're looking for? What are the symptoms you're trying to treat? Because theoretically, that's why you would gravitate towards the plant or towards the product to help treat some symptom that you're uh, hoping to uh, you know, make better. Are you prepared to go so far as some are in calling this a wonder drug? There is no such thing as a wonder drug. There has never been that magic bullet or the magic pill to treat all evils and heal all conditions. And so this is really why I feel we're at the doorstep and we need you know, real academic centers of excellence that can start to look at where this molecule will fit, what those dosing parameters are, do the 
actual regulated scientific studies, not the press releases about this drug is being consumed by X number of patients, similar to what Epidiolix was done south of the border, mm -hmm. where now you have an FDA or a Health Canada approved drug so that Canadians can feel confident when 21 of my 25 patients come and talk to me in my clinic that I can help guide them towards here's a product that we know we have the science that has caught up to what we are accepting as societal norms currently. Hmm. The, the effects of THC, both positive and negative, have I think been well known for a very long time. Why is there so little empirically provable evidence on CBD so far? That's a good question. I think, you know, when you look at the regulatory framework of cannabis, we are at a unique moment in history because Canada has now created an environment where you not only have a medical legal framework, but you have a recreational uh, framework and the Canadian population drove us here. So we have the opportunity now to lead the globe and to lead this you know, scientific move forward and give people credible information. And so we've only been four, you know, five years into a medical legal, a true legal framework. Yes, it's been available since 2000, and, since 2000, but in 2013 was really when that shift was made. And in 2018 is when the cultural shift is made from an acceptance perspective. But it's the first time that a drug has pre seeded science into acceptance. Hmm. And now it's time for science to catch up and that is the opportunity that's in front of us. If you don't want, and I get it, a wonder drug is not exactly a scientific term, it's a, it's a media term, it's a showbiz term. But if you don't want to call it a wonder drug, what colloquial expression would you use to describe it? I would say, uh, you know, CBD is a molecule like any other molecule. I said colloquial. No one says molecule <laughs> in colloquial English. So, you know, here's what I would say. It's a drug that can help you with specific conditions, but we don't know exactly where its maximal benefit is. We have good evidence in epilepsy, as I stated. There's some reasonable evidence in chemo-induced nausea and vomiting for drugs, molecules like Sativex, which is a plant-based CBD and THC extract. Hmm. And there's also some evidence in uh, multiple sclerosis for spasticity-related symptoms and pain as well. So those are areas where we know there is evidence. Now we can talk about sleep, anxiety, PTSD, um, Alzheimer's, all of these other neurodevelopmental possibilities. And again, we are at the doorstep. Should you go out and start consuming CBD oil and stop your anti-epileptics? Absolutely not. And people are doing this. Should you go out and start con to consume CBD and stop your opioids? Absolutely not. I'll show you what that looks like. It looks like serious withdrawal from your opioids. Hmm. Now, we we know that CBD has a multitude of receptors beyond CB1 and CB2 that they interact with. They interact with your glycine receptors, they interact with your opioid receptors, they interact with your dopamine and serotonin receptors. So we do know that there will be overlay in many of these conditions. But again, we need time to evolve this to the place where we know who, what dose, and how to safely do this for the population. Do you recommend it for your patients yet? Oh, well, you know, again, Steve, when we, we have a very, we're in, again in a very interesting moment. So, you know, we have some of our regulatory uh, bodies that say, hands off, we don't know enough. But, you know, where does that sit in terms of the Hippocratic Oath? When I have a patient in front of me who wants to have a discussion about cannabis, if I put my hands up and, and, and throw my hands up and say, well, you know, I can't help you, where do they go? They get the information wherever. You, we're here sitting down because of the plethora of information that's out there for Canadians. Much of it bad. M well, much of it mixed, mm -hmm. some of it bad, some of it good. It was completely positive for a while. Now that it's legal, the, the negative is catching up. And really, it should be balanced, mm. right? And so... My, I feel that it's, uh, the onus is on myself to educate myself, to then have the discussion with my patient to the best of my ability, guide them through the industry, guide them through what might be safe from trying a CBD-based product, when to potentially integrate a THC product. And so, you know, all of these concepts that THC is the bad molecule, CBD is the good molecule, these are just concepts. Mm -hmm. There isn't any drug that we can give that if you don't give too much of it, has a negative consequence. But if you give the right amount of it in a low dose, has a positive consequence. The HIV neuropathy patient that was complaining that, you know, what, these symptoms I can't handle, but if I smoke my joint in the 80s, uh, I had some relief of my neuropathic pain. Do you think they were consuming CBD, Steve? Probably, Probably. not. Probably, Probably not. not. Okay. Probably not. And so, again, we need, we need a, a, a solid regulatory framework okay. to take these drugs from where they are today to where the public can start to be reliably uh, convinced about them. And really, the, you know, the physician culture can also start to understand mm -hmm. this the way we know how. 
Um, and again, that will only come through science and, and R&D development. Well, is science and is research and development leaping on this yet? Oh, absolutely. So I think, you know, you've seen uh, multiple centers popping up. We're working one at uh, the University Health Network as well, a, a big uh, academic consortium potentially partnering some of what we have from an academic standpoint with industry. And we're looking to launch some big initiatives, even potentially with some uh, pharmacy chains over the next while. So I, I think, you know, we're moving towards more acceptance and having a credible voice start to lead this, I hope, uh, over the next five to 10 years. But to be clear, no, but, or maybe can you, can you tell us at what, how much confidence do you have making a recommendation about the appropriate dosage where this stuff works? So here we go. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, what are people consuming? So I'll just tell you many anecdotal stories. Mm -hmm. Patients come into my office and I have rheumatoid arthritis. I've been on my, you know, biologic medications. There's been some failure. Uh, you know, my cousin brought me this product from Colorado and I take half a mil under my tongue three times a day. And you know what, doc, it's not doing anything for me. So I pick up the bottle, it has maybe three milligrams per mil, some really low, almost homeopathic dose of the drug that they've spent $200 for. Uh, at least in Canada, we have 20 milligrams per mil. And you know, and there's a, a one company that has 100 milligrams per mil. So when you start to trial something like a CBD, you need to have the guidance of your physician who can get you to at least a therapeutic threshold to see, are you having an effect? And again, is it, it pain is not all pain. All pain is not pain. Mm. Neuropathic pain, inflammatory pain, nociceptive pain. These are all different types of pain. What was the last one? Nociceptive. Nociceptive, so, so, what does that mean? So if I were to stick a needle in your hand right now, you would pull back very fast. Mm. Your nociceptive uh, receptors and fibers fire, and that is a very uh, intense kind of pain. Post-surgically, nociceptive pain early on is a problem. Inflammatory pain uh, typically takes over for the next 72 hours. And then if you're unlucky, you linger with neuropathic type symptoms for months after that. And so there's a constellation of pain in of itself that people need to grasp in terms of what molecules might be beneficial. And again, we're only focused on THC or CBD, and there's so many other multitude of, of molecules to, to start to investigate in this plant as we move forward. Are we too early in the process here so that when people do go to get this product, however they get it, they are aware enough of what dose they're ingesting? No, and, and, and that's another issue. So, you know, what is a trial? And then, you know, what is the cost of this medication? And so, you know, a little bottle of 60 mils is about $100 for a patient. If I were to tell you to take 200 mils a day or 200 milligrams a day, that's probably, you know, let's say if it's 25 milligrams, it's maybe eight mil mils a day. Every 10 days, you might need another bottle of, of this potential CBD oil that may be beneficial. And that's not a cheap outlay for the average, you no. know, individual. That would not especially be on the formula yet. Patients struggling, with, and absolutely, yeah. especially patients struggling with pain who are already mm -hmm. struggling just, you know, with their life typically in general mm -hmm. to add that to this. So I, it's very hard to think that many people, even when they trial this, get to a dose that is potentially meaningful for an effect that they're looking for. In which case, it is, it is legally purchasable today though, right? At licensed vendors, it is legally purchasable. You could purchase this through the Ontario Cannabis Stores, any regulated legal entity from the recreational perspective. If I, as a physician, give you a authorization, we don't prescribe, there is no DIN, and that's what we're talking about, getting a potential drug investigation number for one, one of these products, if we do it correctly and take it down the regulatory uh, pathway. Uh, and so if I wrote you an authorization form, you could then approach any one of our 180 licensed producers now in this mm -hmm. country that has a license from the government to sell you that you could then get a product from. Now, is each licensed producer producing the same product? Absolutely not. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to talk about really where we need to move to for protecting the public, we need to understand what are going into these bottles, what are going into the, you know, the, 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 the bottle or the canister that you open that has your plant. We need a, you know, a system to barcode to understand, you know, yes, you got X product and this is actually what the product is. There is no other industry where that doesn't occur. I can't authorize something for you and you get something other than what I intend intended for you. And so, you know, this is really, uh, we have a lot of um, positive moves ahead of us in terms of getting to where we want to be with these products. So for CBD, this truly is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. We're just <laughs> at the beginning here, right? We are absolutely at the beginning. Do you like that I, little I, 60s reference I, I, there? I absolutely yeah. do. I absolutely <laughs> do. Uh, we always appreciate your visits to TVO because we're so much smarter after uh, we spend 15 minutes with you. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Steve. Dr. Great. Hans Clark, Director of Pain Services, Toronto General Hospital and the University Health Network. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario.
Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.